Okay, so for this video, we're going to look at uh, a couple things related to what we call calorimetry and ultimately asking the question, how do we know what or how many calories are coming from a food stuff that we eat? Now, previously in class, we had talked about how carbohydrates are four kilocalories per gram, fats are nine kilocalories per gram, and proteins are four kilocalories per gram. And I kind of told you that's a rough estimate based on some research we've done on, on those three macronutrients. But let's get a little bit more into the how do we know this and why are these different. And so in order to do that, I want to start here with understanding that whatever it is we take in, whether it is glycogen, glucose, which our body stores as glycogen, which is carbohydrate, whether it's triglycerides, fats, or whether it's proteins, amino acids, uh, we will find ways to utilize any three of those macronutrients to ultimately enter into glycolysis in the Krebs cycle and ultimately form ATP. Now, having said that, we also said in class there's a preferred route, there's non-preferred routes, we'll, we'll get into that. But how do our cells get this energy? And so in order to understand that, I want to throw out some two basic terms uh, that are terms we've probably used before, but maybe not totally understood. Uh, so this idea of metabolic rate, this idea more specifically of resting metabolic rate, because that's a term we often throw around. What's your metabolic rate? And if, if you have a high metabolic rate, that's a good thing. If you have a low metabolic rate, well, that's a bad thing. Well, let's try to clear that up a little bit. First of all, um, metabol metabolic rate is simply the energy required, cellular energy required for something. Now, we typically say with resting metabolic rate, that's to be at rest. Now, that's really hard to measure because rest can be kind of variable. You know, if you're sitting at a desk, is that resting? If you're sleeping, is that resting? What is that? And so because of that, we often use a, a more precise term, which is called basal metabolic rate, which is the absolute minimal amount of energy, cellular energy needed to sustain life. And we can measure this under conditions. We can actually measure uh, some ventilatory things to assess this. But for right now, I just want to have us understand these terms, this idea of metabolic rate. And this is key because this resting metabolic rate, this the means to which, the amount of which energy cells need, um, obviously changes during a day. We have resting metabolic rate, which for most of us is about 70% of our total energy expenditure. In other words, 70% of the energy we use all day is simply just to keep us alive. But clearly that's not everything. There are, there are other things we do. Some of you, you know, exercise or climb stairs or do something that requires a little bit more energy at rest. And we'll get into that. And that does take up a little bit more than just resting metabolic rate. And so the issue has always been, well, how do you, how do you measure this? Now, in a perfect scenario, you know, we would be able to put some sensor in a cell and be able to measure how much energy it uses. But as you can imagine, that's not very easy to use to do. And so because of that, we've come up with, with two kind of methods to measure this. One is what we call direct, and one is what we call indirect calorimetry. Now direct, I'm going to talk about what we're not actually going to do. Um, and indirect, I'll kind of hint to a, a little bit later on in our, in our class. Direct calorimetry would be a, basically a direct method to actually measure byproducts of energy utilization. And typically in the human body, by the way, just like in other organisms, uh, this can be measured by heat. The amount of energy we produce is generally equivalent to the heat we produce. We see this in computers. We see this in ourselves. When we use energy, we start to get warm. We start to sweat because of that. And so heat is directly a measure of energy. We could call that direct calorimetry. Indirect would be not looking at energy, but potentially looking at some of the foodstuffs we use to form energy and seeing how they're used. We're going to get that into that a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, but I want to talk about direct calorimetry because this is what's really fascinating. And this is, this is going to begin the conversation of, well, why aren't all carbohydrates the same? And, you know, when we said, well, you know, most carbohydrates are about four kilocalories, but why about when they have the same chemical structure, why aren't they exactly the same? Well, it's understanding how this works. And so what a bomb calorimeter is, is simply a device that is going to produce, for 
better terminology, an explosion or a means to burn up some substance. In this case, we'll just call it a carbohydrate. And what we do is we put it inside this bin. Here we can see this, this metal, this tin bin right here. Uh, and inside there's an inner area that's filled with water. And inside that we have the food stuff that we are going to burn off. And the reason we do it this way is because we know that if we were to burn all this, if we were to get this substance to use all the energy it has, it will then produce an amount of heat. And again, heat should be related directly to the energy produced. Well, that's hard to measure the heat, but if we can measure the temperature of the water around this substance, and if we can change the, if we can measure the change in that temperature, and if we know how much water is in here, and we know that one milliliter of water is one milligram, one gram of uh, in weight, we can actually directly assess how much energy is used. And so quite literally what we do is we take something, we put it in here, and we explode it. See how much energy is produced, and that is a direct way to measure calories in a substance. And because of that, this is what we get. And we, I think we referred to this table um, back a week or two ago. And what we see roughly is that in carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, it's about, carbohydrates is about 4, it's 4.2. Fats is 9.4, we round it to 9. And proteins is what gets a little weird. And, and this is why I'm going to pause here a little bit, because as we'll see when we get to proteins, proteins have a unique structure in that they contain nitrogen. And so unlike in the bomb calorimeter, where there is energy produced from the utilization of the nitrogen, the human body is not made to utilize nitrogen in the same way. We do not metabolize nitrogen well at all. And so because of that, the kilocalories per gram that we see in a bomb calorimeter for proteins is not actually the same the human body can actually utilize. And so, even though in a bomb calorimeter, it's somewhere in the ballpark of about 5.7 kilocalories per gram, in the actual human body, actually our metabolism, our small intestine, is actually 4.2. Um, and you're gonna see why in a second these, although specific numbers, there's a range here, and you'll see why in a second. And last, which I'm not gonna get into real a lot here, is alcohol, which technically is a carbohydrate, but does act a little bit differently in a bomb calorimeter it is a few more calories per gram. So another reason as far as not to um, drink that, um, but that's another conversation. So that's direct calorimetry. Well, here's where we get with some of the issues. And this is where we're going to introduce and we're going to return to this when we talk about sweeteners and supplements and types of these macronutrients that maybe don't have the same caloric density as these macronutrients. And so let's just use a couple of examples here. Uh, what I told you with protein, remember four kilocalories per gram, fats, nine kilocalories per gram, carbohydrates, four kilocalories per gram. But as you can see here, and this is just a few examples, not every protein or every fat or every carbohydrate is exactly the same. So if we were to take protein from an egg, an egg white, that is pretty close to four, it's 3.9 kilocalories per gram. That's pretty good, it's pretty close, right? However, if you take protein from the bran of a wheat kernel, it's only about 1.82 kilocalories per gram. It's not four, that's almost half actually. So that's a little bit different. That's a, we have to figure that in. Now, we generally don't. We generally treat all proteins the same, but understanding that, wow, not, not all proteins are four. Um, on top of that, there are also some, and this is where we'll get into sweeteners and other things, there are some carbohydrates which are very unique. And I'm going to start with the one that's probably more prevalent in your diet, which is fiber. Uh, insoluble fiber, what we see in flaxseed, uh, some brands, uh, we generally, because of their density and because of the way they travel through the small intestine, we often don't fully break these down to a, a size to which they can be transported through the small intestine into the blood. And so we, in other words, don't absorb these or absorb these fully. And so these end up passing through the small intestine, through the large intestine, and unused in the body. And so because of that, these, although they're carbohydrates, 
are not going to be four kilocalories per gram. They're going to be less than that. And that's important to understand. If a diet is going to be high in insoluble fiber, yes, those are carbohydrates, sure. But are they exactly four kilocalories per gram carbohydrate? Well, in reality, no. And that's when we get to other things like polydextrose, and we're going to talk about sweeteners, uh, ACE-K, um, saccharin, sweet and low, that alter their caloric density and some of their chemical structures so that they're not four kilocalories per gram, that they're actually one or even less kilocalorie per gram. And so that's key to understand here is that we are, we're looking at something very unique when it comes to fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And, and as I'm often going to say in this class, oftentimes nutrition is as is, is much an art as it is a science. And, and yes, there are clear values here, but within each of these macronutrients, there can be a wide variability in how much caloric density is in each of these. In the next video, we're going to talk about resting, resting metabolic rate and, and eating and how that changes with exercise as well. So uh, look at the next video.